Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And today we're going to look at a, two comics, same script, different artists. Uh, we did this a while back, Ed, with a McFarlane and Marshall Rogers G.I. Joe issue. Uh, really liked the results of that. It's fun to see different artists and how they interpret the same material. And so I was excited to uh, have some Kayfabers recommend this story. And it's a bonus that one of the artists is Alex Toth, uh, one of my favorites. So this was done... I think in the 70s for Charlton, there was some kind of a fallout between Alex Toth and Charlton. So he ended up not giving them the art or not allowing them to print it. And so they had these other artists come in, um, Charles Nichol Nicholas and Wayne Howard. So we're going to look at this six page story called Bookworm. On the left will be the Alex Toth page. On the right will be the uh, Charles Nicholas Wayne Howard pages for comparison's sake. The story is, um, I believe this ran in one of their uh, horror anthologies or was going to run in one of their horror anthologies. The story on the right ultimately was printed in Beyond the Grave, number 15. So Charlton, like DC and, and Marvel, they ran a lot of these uh, short story, you know, like, like uh, genre books that would run several short comic stories. And that's what this is. I think the reason there was a fallout is Alex Toth was supposed to be like the highest paid artist at the at the company a company notorious for not paying their artists much he wanted favored nations <laughs> give, give me give me 13 dollars, not 12 well somehow he found out that wasn't you know that wasn't the case and they weren't honoring his agreement or whatever Fucking and so Dicko, uh, man. walked out so uh ultimately the alex toth story saw print in monsters attack number four many years later i think in black and white and the original art, I believe, was printed in one of those IDW Big Alex Toth hardcover books um, that Dean Mullaney put together. Uh, I believe the, the original story is available in one of those editions as well. And it's kind of neat. The lettering is in red, which uh, I've seen in some old original art. Not sure. I guess red reproduces the same way black does in terms of light reproduction. But it was kind of weird if you see the original art to see red lettering. So starting with page one here. Um, we see different treatments on lettering is the first thing that stands out. The Alex Toth story on the left is lettered by Alex Toth. Yeah. And so the font is a little bit different. And I was looking at the bookworm font and it's, it appears to be some sort of mechanical font. Like the letters are very consistent and very stiff. And I was trying to figure out if it's like a Leroy font, if there are like other fonts that went with the Leroy lettering guide. Oh, you're talking about the guys on the, on the right on side? On the right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it is very mechanical looking, man. I actually kind of like how that looks, but it's it's not a font that I recognize. So I don't know if that's coming out of a Leroy guide or something comparable to that or how that's produced. Um, so we see differences in the approach of the splash page. Some of this stuff's going to be subjective. Quite frankly, I don't think the, uh, the Charles Nicholas version is poorly done at all. It's it's serviceable. It's very clear. It's easy, easy to read. And because the story is so similar, even the panel breakdowns are similar for the most part. So what we see in differences for the, you know, the major differences are compositional. Um, Alex Toth definitely, I think, is more thoughtful when it comes to composition. So he's creating depth in that splash page, I think, more effectively. It feels like greater depth than what we see in the, uh, in the, in the Charles Nicholas version. There's more acting with the uh, librarian or the bookshop owner, you know, carrying the, the, the piles of books there. That's a good point. I always try to make my characters do something and not just stand around. Yeah, that's the thing. It's uh, this Nicholas thing. It's it's very it's very rigid, and there's just more bounce to the uh, the, the Alex Toth work. Like this this video is going to show my limits of like uh, art criticism because I am a provincial sort who doesn't know art but knows what he likes. Yeah, and Ed, you said you know it's more uh, more static or rigid. You see two strong diagonals in the first two Alex Toth panels. Uh, you know, you see that it's tilted, the, uh, I don't know, perspective or whatever. What would be vertical, like the backs of the bookshelves in that first panel, you see are set at an angle. Um, not exactly a Dutch angle, but definitely the angle, you know, visually that's something to show things are off. You know, something's wrong here. To set a tone, if you will, it's uncomfortable to begin with. So story storytelling wise, too, like the book that he's holding uh, is another. You know, it's a very strong diagonal, and it's pointing to the next panel that you're supposed to read. So it's a, a directional device. Yeah, very much so. <clears throat> oh, 
here we see some variation panel wise where Nicholas is breaking up that third panel, making it like that tall vertical panel. Um, with the Alex Toth page, we see a similar large panel, but he's putting it as the last panel of the page, kind of the end of the scene. Yeah, the the uh, Nicholas panel by just having that sort of dead bottom th- bottom third uh, on that page, it just it's it's not an efficient use of of the comic page. Uh, there's there's like sort of no reason for it in a way, you know. It's it's a it's a dead piece, man. You could you could just as well cut that panel in half and still get the same results storytelling wise. Yeah, what's happening in this sequence is that this this old guy that has bought the book on page one, he is uh, kind of a miser, like a wealthy guy, but not liked by anyone. And so he's walking by a cemetery, and I actually think the cemetery shows up much better in, in Nicholas's version on the right. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's passing this cemetery where uh, there's actually a funeral is going on, and he has an interaction with the son of the man who is being buried. We don't see the burial part happening, but it's in conversation amongst these characters. So I don't feel, I I love Alex Toth. I don't feel a super strong piece to this page on the left uh, compared to the page on the right, except for the one point you made, Ed, that that panel on the right bottom is kind of wasted space. You could easily crop that at like the two thirds mark of the page and you're not going to lose any information. You have all, all your characters' heads are contained in what would be you know, like a square panel, a, a one, a six panel grid size panel. And here's the thing, uh, to, to me, it's very smart that, uh, you know, there's three characters that, that we're dealing with here. Um, it's very smart that Toth broke up that bottom panel and allowed some space. Like if you look at the Nicholas version, it's a very congested panel with that big head. And then, you know, this guy's squeezing the, the other characters in there, just more room to breathe in the Toth, uh, final panel. And it allows an opportunity to get some setting in there. Now, now I, I will confess that I did not read this, but um, the the bookshop sign uh, on, in the ne- Nicholas thing, it, it's making me wonder if they're, in terms of storytelling, like beating something over the head uh, to, <laughs> to us because like we just don't get that in the other Alex Toth versions. So you know we see that books bookshop sign prominently. Uh, does that matter? Yeah, I don't think it does. Um, I, I have read this, and I don't think that really matters too much. It's it's just clarity, I think. Not not a bad thing. The other big difference I see in all of this uh, is character design. So our main character, this is essentially a one-character story. The guy buys this book. Uh, we're going to get into what happens to that book. But he's just this miserable old man. And I think like you see a very big contrast between Nicholas's version of this old guy uh, barely even looks like an old man quite frankly maybe more in some panels than others but in the Toth design it is really a craggy face like there are lines it looks chiseled and and, and damaged better body language uh, you know with him literally pinching a penny uh, in the in the in the first panel and just kind of like shooing those people off in the last like these are animated figures you know and and uh the nicholas version is is very very static clip art almost wow here we get a beautiful shot by alex toth in panel one of of page three just stunning and demonstration of what alex toth can do and does well um one of the knocks on alex toth is that he doesn't have a great story in his in his resume and this story points that out very clearly because this story is not a good story at all. It's barely interest. You know, the interest is that Alex Toth is drawing it. Mm-hmm. As far as I'm concerned, this guy buys a book, takes it home. He's looking for a journal to write his autobiography in because he's interested in achieving some level of immortality by living on. You know, after his body dies, he'll have this autobiography, just like we do with our <laughs> comics. Sure. Um, and what happens? Uh, as he is writing and spending all this time writing, he starts to become like translucent, like he's disappearing. And so he runs back to the bookshop to, to see like, what is the problem? What's happening? Do you know anything about this? And there's a legend about this particular journal, basically that he is going to put himself into this book. And then a future generation, whenever they open the book, will, will bring him back to life, literally. So pretty dumb. Yeah, it's really stupid. Like I'm literally zoning out and just like looking at this art and look at the texture 
uh, with yeah, like let's just talk drawing things as opposed to just like the nuts and bolts storytelling stuff. Look at the uh, leaf texture that uh, Toth gets in that first uh, panel with the chiaroscuro, um, you know, shadow leaves, silhouette leaves, and, and compare that to the Nicholas version. His little cartoon cloud trees. That's a really, drew. really good call, Ed. Um, and you can even extend it to the building in the background since no they doubt. both have those in both panels. And you see a lot more attempt at texture in the Alex Toth version from the brick walls to the to the roof. Um, just a much more interesting drawing, as you say. The way uh, Alex Toth had described his process is that uh, you, you break things down to their essentials. You, you, you get the compositions in place. You get the shapes in place. Uh, and then you just, you draw the hell out of it. You know what I mean? Like you start from a very, it's like, um, it's like macro to micro or micro to macro, one, one or the other. Like you start off with basic shapes and then just build that stuff up. And, and like, you could see that here, you know? Yeah. And when, it, once he has those shapes in place, then he goes on to make interesting textures to yeah. fill them up. Whether it's the floor behind, uh, in behind our main character in his study or in his library, uh, the textures on the table, the chair that he's sitting on, and I think panel four with the uh, whenever the old man's holding like the the examining the paper. Um, one, it reminds me of when we were looking at the Will Eisner sketchbook and calling out how the paper stock felt. <laughs> it feels like that's what this guy's <laughs> doing. It really reminded me of somebody like Alex Toth, somebody that's an artist would care about that. How many times have you felt a piece of paper when you're at an art store thinking about which which paper to buy? Um, that feels like something that a paper connoisseur would notice and put in there. Uh, and, and I don't get a sense of that from Nicholas's side of it. You know, it's, it's a much more generic uh, treatment on the right, for sure. Nothing wrong against storytelling wise, but also nothing stands out as, you know, you've got a story that's not too good to begin with, and then you have art that pretty bland. Yeah, and it, it, the stuff on the right, it makes you appreciate a guy like Klaus, who has, who sort of fetishizes the generic, but then adds some morbidity that makes it very sexy and interesting. Because this is, you know, a few chromosomes away from like a Dan Klaus page or something. That's a good point. I think about Ogden Whitney a lot, who is almost like the uber Klaus in terms of the generic piece. And it's the same deal. Like there is some quality. If you push it far enough, it becomes sublime and, and strange on its own merit. And we're not at that point here with Nicholas's art. Um, but even the, the old man examining the book in panel three, you know, it's actually a two panel sequence of him really examining the book. You get more of the body language and things. Mm -hmm. So before you go, just just look at that hand that is uh, wielding that brush and writing in that biography like Toth, and he's on the record, man. Go check out some of that Steve Rude correspondence. He is on the record for not faking the funk, man. Know what the heck you're doing. That hand has weight. Like that middle finger is pressing the the white piece of paper and guiding the hand as it's as it's uh, writing. Um, masterful. Yeah, it's it's really great. Even the hand that's holding the book open in that panel is is equally well done. It's not floating. It, it really looks. You know, it really looks like it's there. Um, this is this is a great compare and contrast. All right, so page four again. Start out with this this angled composition. Uh, man, these are really good comparisons. I think these first panels on on each page because you see that static horizontal and verticals on Nicholas's panel one, and you see the diagonal choices on Toth's panel one. Um, things are starting to go wrong in the Toth story, and we know it because that camera has tilted. Yeah, plus plus from panel one, uh, we're, he's launching us into it. Um, if that was Nicholas's intention, he didn't get that across in his panel one. The big difference, one of the big differences panel-wise that I noticed when I was reading this is if you look at Nicholas's page, it's like panel two lines up with Toth's panel three. Mm -hmm. Um and, and really, I should say panels two and three are reversed uh, between these two pages. Sure. Yeah. So it's the same sequence. It's just showing, you know, it's just changing the order of that sequence between these two artists. I don't know that it's dramatically effective, more effective one way or the other, but it is a choice and, you know, something to kind of think of. This, these are the thoughts that I think of when I'm composing my pages, right? Where do I show a close up? Where do I show a reaction, you know, like a, like a facial reaction? to get whatever emotional response. Do you show the event first and then the reaction or the reaction first and then a close up of what they're reacting to? 
Again, I don't know that there's a clear right wrong, but it is interesting to see different artists thinking about it differently. I, I don't know Toth to use very many uh, me mechanical tools, meaning meaning zipatones and stuff. Uh, so it's interesting to see him giving his best shot at this like translucent guy thing. I think it's very effective in that last panel where you see where you, where you see the the full circumference of the hat brim. Um, yeah, that's a that's a strange. Not easy to visual. do, like no. like not easy to come up with, and on the actual like skin texture. I don't think he quite accomplished accomplished it, but what can you do? This, you're, you're being asked to draw something pretty pretty tough. I like the figure in, in the fourth panel of the old man standing in the doorway. It's a small figure. It's a couple of brush strokes to indicate his coat and the folds on his coat. Very, very simple, but I don't know. Just as a drawing, I find it to be attractive. Yeah, the uh, the... The translucency of the figure is really strange in both of these. And it bums me out that we're looking at one in black and white yeah. and one in color because there's such a dramatic difference in how that's presented. Here's one thing that Nicholas did that I think is smarter than Toth, uh, which is probably few and far between uh, as we look <laughs> through this. As as the figure gets more translucent, uh, he, he nixes the thick black eyebrows. You know, I don't know that he established that as being a character trait on the previous pages. I, I forget already. Um, but that's something that Toth could have done. You know, take take that black out of there and then that would have sold it. Especially, it's almost like super smart to initially create a character with those thick black eyebrows so that when you do make them translucent, you take that out and it just, it sells the idea more. Here's something that he doesn't do as well. In that last panel, the close-up of the guy, uh, Nicholas, on the right. So in, in the last panel, we don't, there's nothing behind him. Like, we don't get to see the translucency easily illustrated because the only thing behind him is this one kind of horizontal diagonal line. But I, it's weird. Like, I don't even know what that line is. Is that a ceiling and wall line? Like, if it were something that was more identifiable, I feel like we would get the translucency. You know, we're not seeing the back of his collar. Um, you pointed out Alex Toth shows the full rim of the hat. Uh, we're not seeing that quality right. with, with Nicholas's art. So like some of the translucency isn't as effective. Like we should see that behind the guy's like mouth jawline. You should see the back of his coat there or the back of his hat. Jimmy, this is why when you're penciling, you can't listen to music and stuff because you have to think about this stuff. You have to think about the <laughs> physics of the drawing. You have to think about what you're drawing because I think I would have made that same mistake as, as Howard and hopefully would have caught it and ink, but I've made similar mistakes where like I screw up the physics and stuff a million times, and I think it was because I was allowing some distraction in my process, man. But if you really think things out, like you just get a better quality image. And I guess that's why Toth is like texturing that face when he's showing the shoulder of the guy he's looking at. Um, I still feel like there could be a better way, but what am I? I'm, I'm gonna tell Dallas Toth how to draw. Like, come on now. It's tough because this is the gimmick of the story, right? Is this guy becoming translucent? So from a storytelling perspective, whoever's doing the story should be thinking in those terms of like, how do I show off this power? Yeah. So Alex Toth's page, very restrained here. He has learned a little bit about what this book is about and he's okay with it. Like in his mind, this is going to be his key to, to immortality. So it's not a... Uh, you know, it's not a deal breaker necessarily. Mm -hmm. And my suspicion is that we're going to see some flourishes on the next page. And so if that's the case, reel it in a little bit. You know, if, if Toth's going to do something, uh, some payoff on, on the final page, it's a six page story, we're on page five. If there's going to be some cool visual graphic thing, let's make this page more static, more it, vanilla, more more bland. And it's the page turn. So, so you know, five five you know you flip the page and then you see page six on that left facing page that's your opportunity to to sell some stuff man um but uh you know really good drawings uh great spotted blacks in the in the toth piece and perhaps there's good spotted blacks on the on the nicholas piece I, you, you know you can't tell it as as uh easily as you can in the toth piece two two distinct pieces i see between these pages the spotted black said that you describe, I'll go one step further and say it gives it a night context in the Alex Toth mm. page that we don't see in Howard in the Nicholas page. 
I always think about that, like like setting, you mm-hmm. know, like being able to tell setting from the drawings. How do you communicate nighttime? How do you draw a nighttime scene? You know, because it's not always spotting blacks in the case of a black and white comic. It probably is. Uh, but you could do it through colors, too. Um, but I think it's very effective in communicating that it's nighttime. You get a sense of, of darkness and nighttime. The other piece in panel four of Alex Toth's uh, side the character's walking by some other like bystanders on the street and we see their reaction. It's a way to communicate the grotesque of the situation, which, you know, it's a comic you take it for granted, especially in the context of a, imagine buying this off the newsstand or whatever, all comics have weird shit in them. So let's see some people react so we can emphasize the weirdness of this. We don't get any of that from, from Nicholas's side. You know, whenever we see the street scene, there are, there's no one else on the street, which may be, communicates that it's late at night but it doesn't communicate the weirdness of like what's happening yeah he's adding a lot more gray value uh, on this page and uh and just another thing i i noted here is um i i like the breathing room with the amount of gutter space that toth has uh so there's like a lot of breathing room with the gutter space and there's a lot of breathing room with the balloons and it just uh it's more visually pleasing to me compositionally and here we are, final page. And indeed, Alex Toth did have something in mind graphically. Uh, very dramatic difference here visually between the two pages. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, <laughs> this this is you know when you have the superstar on the b-ball team, and then you have the guy who tosses him the pass. You have Carl Malone on the left, man. John Stockton on the right. This is probably the page that has the greatest difference in terms of visual impact, and not because of the obvious, you know, different composition. But you're creating this idea of like this character is now in the book. And once he's in the book, it's up to somebody else to open the book and free him eventually. So he's trapped. He's in a prison of his own design in this book. And now the worms descend on it. And he's helpless to do anything as the as the worms are literally consuming his immortality. You get a pretty interesting page layout to kind of like make the panel smaller and tighter and, and smaller as it goes because you're trapped. And now these worms are descending on you. There is nothing like that at all on, on Nicholas's page on the right. It's yeah. very by the numbers. I mean, we even have like the, the haunted house, you know, and the moonlight trope there on display, like uninspired. Uh, Just doing a job. Man. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Like graphically, there's nothing really there. It's a shitty looking book with worms on it. So, yeah, there's some decomposition and things are visible there. But I don't know about the impact. The Toth piece, it really is like, wow, it's the end of this guy's life. And it's a miserable ending. Yeah, yeah. This is a great illustration of, like, master cartoonist, everybody else, man. He's a thinking cartoonist. Yeah, for sure. And, and thinking graphically. Yes. And uh, there's there's that sort of insecurity that a lot of cartoonists feel. It's a it's a naivete. It's, it's usually the young always feel this, man. And sometimes, like, the older heads still operate with this logic but there's a lot of negative space on this page and i think the tendency for many cartoonists is to like fill that space you feel like you're cheating or you know you're so much jobber that you're afraid that your editor's gonna question you about why you know maybe maybe you'll get half the page rate if you you know don't fill up the space but great storytelling purposes to uh create a page composition this way it's not willy-nilly this is not you know todd mcfarlane just trying to make fun shapes and and put put drawings inside of it there's a real storytelling application here yeah the use of black you mentioned a couple pages ago how well he's spotting blacks i think it's a really good use of black here to get across the finality the death that we're seeing and i like charles nicholas wayne howard having this comparison because i at a glance, when I first saw this story, it was like, there's nothing wrong with this, their treatment of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, very competent, you know, as cartoonists. Um, sometimes you see jobs that are bad or poor, and that would be nuts to compare, I think, to Alex Toth. I think what you see here is very much a journeyman. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's competent. Average. Right, it, yeah, it's average. average. It's, it's all the things that you would never want to hear about your own work. <laughs> competent, average, basic, job. Uh, this guy got his paycheck, you know, he fed his family for the week or whatever. Just wash, rinse, repeat. It reminds me of like those issues that Jim Shooter drew at Marvel as like a demonstration of like Marvel storytelling mm-hmm. when he was there. Very by the numbers, 
easy to follow, easy to understand, but not exciting, not taking risks. Yeah. Um, you know, not, not, not sort of going for it and trying something that maybe it won't work. Yeah. You know, maybe this, this unusual page composition isn't going to be successful, but at least it's interesting in taking a chance. And I suppose if you're a publisher or an editor, you wouldn't want all your artists doing that all the time. But as a reader, it's a lot more exciting to look at. Absolutely. And there was a reason why uh, Marvel, whenever, I mean, uh, DC, whenever they do those House of Mysteries, House of Secrets, all of that, go through those old back issue bins, man. They lead off with the with the Toth strips more often than not. There's a reason for that because the other two stories that are going to be in that issue are going to look like this Joey jerk off on the right. All right, Ed. Uh, any other thoughts before we wrap this up? Very happy to look through this. Uh, I know um, when uh, some forget the name of the kayfaber shouts to you whoever you were who, who who hipped us to this man but they did it on facebook and they had some imagery to go along with it i posted uh some some side by sides on the uh, kayfabe instagram and several cartoonists came out r kiku johnson hit it was like yo that bookworm story is like one of my favorite toth stories man it's crazy to see that there's there's like you know the the uh the hollywood version uh the version that saw the light of day uh, so people know this story and very happy to, uh, do this little compare and contrast with you. And I think that, uh, surprisingly, when I put the question out there on the McFarland video, I honestly did not imagine that there really were any others. The truth is it's a couple more, man. So I want to hit the kayfabers up again. And it's like, if there's another one, uh, and where it's, where it operates this way, same script, two different artists, uh, We'll, we could do these things forever. I do love these. This has been one of the funner uh, funner video things that we've done is, is being able to find some of these stories and put them next to each other. It's instructive. It is very much so. So uh, like, follow, and subscribe. Hit the bell icon below this video to be notified when we post new videos. We got that newsletter, man. You got to sign up for that shit, man. Uh, this was very instructive, Jimmy. We got to go make some comics of our own. Why don't you give these dudes a marching orders, man? Read more comics.